The events of that race weekend, from the morning of April 28th, when the teams first assembled at the track, until the evening of Sunday, May the 1st, rest amongst motor racing's darkest times. It was a weekend of tragedy, despair, and death. Ten years on, it may be that some viewers would prefer not to watch the coverage of these events. And if you feel in any way unsure, and I urge you to switch off your TV now. We cannot shy away from the fact that three very serious accidents happened. The events of Imola are a part of the sport's history. The aftermath of that horrible weekend would forever change the way Grand Prix cars are built and forever change the way the races themselves are conducted. We at Speed Channel feel it is only proper that the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix is correctly documented and that, in our opinion, must include correct coverage of Ayrton Senna's fatal accident. All right, thank you, Steve, and hello, everyone. I'm Bob Varsha, along with Steve Matchett and David Hobbs, with you here on Formula One Decade to review the events of the Grand Prix of San Marino in 1994. Steve Matchett, of course, was in the pit lane on that fateful weekend with the Benetton team. David Hobbs was watching on television from his home in England, and I was calling the race from a studio in the United States. Perhaps like you, we all remember where we were on this weekend. A look at the starting grid, third round of the season, third straight pole position for the great Ayrton Senna, but no race finishes to that point, both races that year having been won by Michael Schumacher at that point. It was alongside him on the front. Nicola Larini there standing in for Alessi in the Ferrari. Harkonnen having trouble with the McLaren Peugeot. He'd qualified pretty well in Spain, went quite well in Spain. He's back there in eighth, and then um, Brundle back there in 13th, but with the second one of the McLaren Peugeot. Take note of Michele Alboreto in the Minardi. He, too, would have a role to play on this fateful weekend. As we get to the very back of the grid, you'll notice an empty spot. Simply put, a shortage of cars following the events of Friday and Saturday. Beginning in Friday qualifying with Rubens Barrichello, who at that point was with the Jordan team. Let's review. At top speed at the Variante Bassa, Barrichello leapt the curb, got into the tire wall and the fence, coming from 180 miles an hour to virtually zero in a microsecond. One of the more violent accidents I think I've ever seen. I was watching that in England and absolutely horrified. He was knocked unconscious and says he has no memory of the incident. I just remember saying, oops. It was something that I, I recall. I think, you know, as I crash, my tape rewind. It was something that I, I, I don't go to the crash. I don't, I don't remember crashing. It's something that I just remember the, the, the oops. So it's something that the, the whole weekend itself is a little bit uh, vague in my mind. It's something that... Uh, I think I'm lucky, actually, with that, because it, otherwise, you know, if you feel the power of the impact, it's, it's too bad. It's something that I, many people who have crashed maybe have uh, the same experience. My tape really rewind, and I, I remember just the time that I entered the corner a little bit too fast, and that was the explanation. Well, perhaps Barrichello is lucky that the weekend was just a vague memory. On Saturday in qualifying, Roland Ratzenberger, a rookie, with the Simtech team from Austria, lost the front wing on his car at top speed over the old Gilles Villeneuve corner. He went into the wall nearly head-on and perished. Welcome back to the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix here on F1 Decade. I'm Bob Varsha with David Hobbs and Steve Matchett. The field coming around to form up on the grid in front of the typically massive crowds that jam the circuit name for the late Enzo and Dino Ferrari in Imola, Italy on a Grand Prix weekend. The whole of course event it's a fantastic place to watch a race from that, on that hill there and uh, just a, a great location. Well, the Imola circuit, David, is a you know, of course, is very close to the Maranello factory and a huge amount of Ferrari support. More here, I think, than Monza. To this point of the weekend, of course, two savage accidents. One put Rubens Barrichello in the hospital on Friday. The other took the life of Austrian rookie Roland Ratzenberger on Saturday. The first driver to die on a Grand Prix weekend in a dozen years. So that 
myth of security had been shattered. Now watch the right hand column of cars as the lights go out. J.J. Leto in the Benetton cannot get away. And Pedro Lamy hits him in the rear at full speed in the Lotus. Pedro Lamy had come from 22nd on the grid. There you see him absolutely probably doing 100 miles an hour by the time he got to that stalled car of J.J. Leto. So the whole weekend, again, continuing that terrible, terrible downward sort of spiral. And poor old J.J. Leto. This was his first race start for Benetton. He was signed on as the race driver at the start of the 94 season, but suffered a horrific accident in testing where he broke his neck at Silverstone quite late at night and was unable to start the season. So this was his first race. There's the car that I'd built for the guy right there, along with the other mechanics at Benetton, car number six. See Leto in the spot shadow. Watch Lamy will come from the right-hand line of cars Drive across the track to the left behind another car, totally unsighted as he approaches the stationary Benetton. Here he comes. You see, he hasn't seen that car. He's just seen the other car move around it, and boom, suddenly there's this stationary object. It just the pity of stomach drops right out because you're, you're sitting so low, obviously, you can't see it. Yeah, you can see there wheels and debris Going. flying over the catch fence into the left into the crowd. Leto had both arms out of the cockpit waving that he had stalled, but of course, as you rightly say, guys, just completely unsighted in the way Lana was storming through the field. Now, rather than red flag the race, clean the track and start over, they chose to bring out the safety car, and that became a key issue in what was to follow. Instead of bringing the cars to a stop and allowing the teams to put the tire warmers on the, on, the, on the cars and keep the tires at operating temperature, they cruised around behind the safety car, and those temperatures dropped. We'll talk about that in a moment. The frightening thing to me was JJ had stalled the car on the grid and put his hand in the air to signal that the car had stalled. But the Lotus uh, was obviously blindsided by traffic and back markers at the start of the race, but the impact, the force of the impact was colossal. And I was just terrified there and then because remember by this time we'd had Ratzenberger's fatal accident. We'd had, we'd, you know, we were kind of well under a black cloud by this point anyway, and we had a yet another big accident on the starting grid, and it was my guy. Field coming around. It's worth noting that the corner workers and emergency workers at Imola were regarded as some of the best in the world for the day. Gerhard Berger had a terrible accident backing his car into the wall at this circuit in 1989 and the corner workers ran straight at the still moving fireball saving Berger's life. Max Angelelli driving the safety car and you see the field moving slowly as I mentioned before that would become an issue. Here's our Peter Windsor. I was talking to Max about this several years ago Angelelli and he was saying that when he was deployed, the safety car was when he was told to go out. Within two laps, the brake pedal was basically going to the floor. He was going absolutely as quick as he could go. He knew that so far as the speed that he needed to be doing to keep anything like the right tire temperature in the cars, it was nothing. And a couple of times, Ayrton actually pulled up alongside him, his eyes as big as eggs, sort of making gestures, trying to tell him to go faster because Ayrton knew that he was lo losing tire temperature, losing tire pressure, and there's going to be a massive problem with bottoming as a result. Well, one way or another, the field came around, the safety car pulled off, and Ayrton Senna led Michael Schumacher off into turn one. Notice the car's bottling out, particularly Senna's car, a shower of sparks. Now, that tungsten skids underneath the car, but quite right, what we're talking about is following around with the safety car, and the temperatures begin to drop down in the tires from about 200 degrees F. The pressure's drop and that ride height drops a little more. And at this stage, all the cars were flat bottomed. So as soon as they were traveling on any of the, over any of the undulations on the track, it was really turning the car into a surfboard, taking a lot of the suspension movement out actually to complete zero. 
like a motorcyclist who pegs out if his foot peg strikes the ground if he leans over too far in a corner. On board with Ayrton Senna. The final moments of his life. It's going through the Rivazza, that huge crowd on the left. This is where Barrichello went off. Across the start-finish line they come. Heading for Tamborello Corner. On board with Michael Schumacher. And then it happened. 